The Montreal Protocol was agreed in 1987 and implemented two years later. It's a landmark international agreement designed to protect the Earth's ozone layer. It's also the first environmental treaty to receive worldwide support. The Montreal Protocol is designed to legally enforce the phasing out of ozone-depleting chemicals that exist in household items like fridges. In 1974, scientists discovered that chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, deplete the ozone layer that protects the planet from ultraviolet radiation. In 1985, a gaping hole was discovered above Antarctica. It prompted world leaders to take action and is believed to have averted the collapse of the ozone layer by the middle of the 21st century. The parties meet annually to adjust the protocol in response to new scientific information. So far, that's happened six times. Delegates say the objective is to protect human health and the environment from the harmful effects of a damaged ozone layer. In 1974, Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina mooted the idea that CFC pose an enormous threat to our ozone layer which in turn will cause immediate danger to human health. Among the countries to immediately react to this was Canada and the United States. Even though the United Nations Environmental Programme UNEP, held an international meeting in 1977, and established the Coordinating Committee on the Ozone Layer, which adopted the World Plan of Action on the Ozone Layer, the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer was only signed in 1985. The sentiment drastically changed with new findings of the Antarctica Hole, as well as a study by NASA and World Meteorological Association Group, concluding that continued CFC's emission would result in larger losses of the ozone layer. This led to the formation of the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. The protocol, substituting the Vienna Convention, advances the goal of taking concrete actions to control ozone-depleting substances. In line with this, my presentation will examine the protocol and its impact by discussing key highlights, outstanding values and issues of the same. agreed on 16 September 1987 and entered into force on 1 January 1989, the protocol aims at protecting the Earth's fragile ozone layer by reducing the existing large quantity of production and consumption of its depleting substances in the atmosphere. It has been ratified by all 197 UN countries and 46 of them are its signatories. The protocol distinctive quality is seen in its ability to enable parties to quickly respond to new scientific information and agree to accelerate reductions required on chemicals which it already covers. The protocol later receives 13 adjustments and 5 amendments which further strengthen its application and effectiveness. The most welcoming currently might be the latest addition in Kigali where emission of the alternative to CFCs, namely the HFCs, have been reduced. Besides the adjustments and amendments, parties also meet regularly to decide on any related matters and this further enables effective implementation of the protocol. The protocol contains 20 articles and 6 annexes. Article 2 and 2A to 2J talks about substances and their control measures. Calculation of control levels is in Article 3. Article 4A deals with production and transfer of controlled substances while Article 4B requires establishment for an import and export licensing system. Special treatment for developing countries is laid out by Article 5. Article 6 talks about assessment to be undertaken every four years and Article 7 lays down requirements on submissions of statistical data. Authorized under Article 8 on non-compliance, the Implementation Committee was established in 1990 along with the non-compliance procedure under which the committee operates. The protocol also encourages research 
development or exchanging of information and organization of public awareness under Article 9. Notification to withdraw must be made in accordance with Article 19 of the protocol, whereas Annex A to F details of substances put under control measures. Recognizing its importance, Malaysia responded with an outline of its future environmental strategies and action plans and subsequently ratified the Convention and Protocol on 29 August 1989. The Ozone Protection Section under the Department of Environment was set up on January 1997 as a national focal point and one-stop agency for coordinating, monitoring and implementing all of the Protocol's phase-out activities as per National CFC Phase-out Plan. Kofi Annan, who was then the UN Secretary General, was once quoted to say, perhaps the single most successful international environmental agreement to date has been the Montreal Protocol in which states accepted the need to phase out the use of ozone depleting substances. Based on this submission, among the outstanding features of the protocol is that the instrument is forever regarded as a landmark international environmental agreement. Positively, the control measures under the protocol has also led to productions of new industries worldwide which are devoted to achieving greater energy efficiency and other environment-friendly practices. It is also said that the protocol is a far superior legal instrument compared to the Kyoto Protocol. This view is mostly due to the failure of the latter, and it is believed that such occurred due to interchanging political convictions of party states' administrations and the perceived benefits and costs of both protocols. The US, for instance, differ in their treatments during Reagan and Clinton's administrations towards Kyoto Protocol as well as forecasted the benefits of the Montreal Protocol to be substantial in the short term as well as the long term. Projected cost-benefit analysis of the protocol were also relatively small, where in the US, for instance, it is estimated that the cost for the protocol is 21 billion US dollar, while for the Kyoto Protocol, a staggering 325 billion US dollar will be needed. It is also alleged that the protocol was also favored due to the existing of self-interest of each parties in complying with the requirements. Another outstanding characteristic is the view that the protocol provided an effective mean to dispute resolution through the non-compliance procedure that has become a model for other treaty regimes and the establishment of the implementation committee. It is observed that progressive activities of the committee contributed significantly to overall compliance of the protocol and large parties to improve their performance over the obligations of the instrument. Ultimately, the protocol is applauded for its ability to achieve the desired outcome of reducing usage of depleting substances as well as reduce the Antarctica hole. The annual production of CFCs from 1988 to 1995 decreased by 76% and 98% in recent years. Despite everything, there are still a few issues that might need due consideration. For instance, it might be assumed that domestic self-interest will continue to be an important motivating force, especially in formation of international legal instrument. There are also discussions that the protocol alone is insufficient to curb the problem at hand and international and national actions exceeding the terms of the protocol are needed to be combined. Apart from that, there are also criticism of the funding mechanism to be vague. Back home in Malaysia, it is said that good interactions between the government agencies, industries and society are the key to the success of the protocol implementation. The complete recovery of the ozone layer is expected to achieve later this century. I think we need to monitor the ozone layer at least until then to ensure the effectiveness of the Montreal Protocol. Since the beginning of its activities 26 years ago, the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer has had a direct positive impact on the climate system. The Montreal Protocol reduced the amount of chlorofluorocarbons, which are potent greenhouse gases, in addition to helping the ozone layer 
it really greatly helped the climate changes. In conclusion, although praised universally, it is undeniable that the protocol still has flaws and issues that needs further attention by all nations in the globe. Concerted effort, both at the world stage and by individual nations, is also pertinent. Apart from the foregoing, it is also opined that the protocol may be the best match to complement the Paris Agreement in addressing the issue of climate change. Moreover, although the protocol also gives birth to alternative substances as well as expand industries, the related committee must ensure continuous research and evaluation is still conducted. Nevertheless, as for now, the protocol stands as a signal that intercontinental cooperation for environmental causes is possible and with hope.